All right, everyone, I am on the line with Arvind Rajaswaran. Arvind is a PhD student in machine learning and robotics at the University of Washington. Arvind, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thanks so much, Sam. It's such a pleasure. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Model-based offline reinforcement learning is uh, the topic to, of your research. Your paper is called Morel, uh, Model-Based Offline Reinforcement Learning. That topic has come up quite a bit uh, over the past year or so. Um, it's getting quite popular, uh, and I'm really looking forward to digging into your take. But before we do, tell us about your journey and how you came to work in RL and robotics. Yeah, that's actually a pretty interesting question. Uh, my undergraduate background was actually in something completely different. I was mostly doing like statistical physics and a little bit of like chemical engineering uh, uh, as my formal degrees. And uh, I took a machine learning class by Professor Ravindran back in India, and that kind of really transformed my perspective on things. It it essentially had math very similar to what is used in statistical physics. So I was able to pick up on it pretty quickly, but the applications seemed like really, really cool. So I wanted to like maybe pivot a bit and focus more on machine learning and AI. So that's how I moved into, into the broad field of AI. And when I started out, I had more of a theoretical inclination and bent. And uh, I started out working with my advisor, Professor Sham Kakade, who's like an expert in machine learning theory. And when we were, we were discussing like what might be interesting projects or topics to work on, what we felt was that uh, much of the research, uh, at least on the theory side in machine learning and deep learning was largely explanatory in nature. So deep learning was already working really well. Mm -hmm. And the questions were, how do we why? understand and explain why deep learning is working? Whereas if yeah. you looked at reinforcement learning, what was interesting was that we actually didn't have very good algorithms. Like things were actually not working that well. And there was a very interesting scope to have like an interplay between theory and algorithms, like both develop uh, new algorithms that worked very well, and also try to explain uh, why it is working well and gain a more fundamental understanding. And that's sort of been uh, my PhD journey as well, like trying to show both like empirically uh, good results while at the same time having uh, like a theoretical bent to my work. Nice, nice. And uh, has the the large focus of your work been on model-based RL in particular, or uh, have you explored uh, a, a wide variety of topics within the RL space? I would say the interest in model-based reinforcement learning is relatively recent. Like, uh, the way I'm, I think about my research, at least in the last couple of years, has been the central question of how do we make, uh, uh, how do we create agents that can solve a diverse set of tasks with a modest amount of experience per each individual task? And this is, of course, a very broad uh, question that touches upon a number of different fields, including multitask uh, learning, meta learning, offline learning, and so on. And so that constitutes the space of problems that I've been thinking about. And what I think is a very cool approach or an algorithm to make progress on these domains is model-based RL. So I view model-based RL as providing the algorithmic toolkit to make progress on questions related to multitask learning, meta-learning, offline learning. Got it, got it, got it. So... Um... Maybe the best way to, to go through this is to start from the beginning um, and have you kind of explain the, I'm curious the way you explain model-based RL um, and uh, if it's, you know, the extent to which it will be different from other explanation, explanations we've heard here on the show. Um, so let's start there. Uh, yes. So I guess maybe I could try to, merge some of the ideas from model-based data and offline learning and what got me working on this particular project. Uh, okay. Uh, and hopefully during that, uh, there may be uh, an, an explanation for what is model-based data. And uh, if, if you think about for a moment, like questions in computer vision or NLP, the questions there tend to be much more ambitious and interesting than in traditional reinforcement learning. For example, the questions that we still ask in reinforcement learning are, how can we solve a particular task, like pick up 
a, a particular object with a robot solve a particular Atari game with as minimal samples as possible. This is very different from how people phrase the questions in computer vision. For example, no one asks, can I train a cat detector with 10 samples? Or can I train a cat detector with 20 samples? That's just not an interesting question there. there the questions are, the, how can I identify what, are the, what is the object in an image out of a thousand categories? Like much more broader in scope and much more ambitious. And they really use like a lot of real world data to make that happen. And my goal was to try to emulate some of that in reinforcement learning as well. And now if we start thinking about how can an agent, which lives in a very complex world, let's say a kitchen, for example, it there are so many things that it can do, like open cabinets, like uh, clean pans, uh, like set up dishes and so on, like load a washing, uh, load a, uh, a dishwasher. And... What the space of things that the robot can do is so much more diverse. And what that means is we need to be able to use the data to extract as much information uh, about the world as possible. And I believe models are the way to accomplish that, which is like given uh, a particular state of the world, some either like an explicit state, like things like uh, particular joint configurations of the robots, where are the different objects in the scene, or a much more richer description, such as like images and various LiDAR scans of the scene, uh, as a response to any potential action that the robot can take, how would the world evolve and change? And if you are able to learn uh, such a model, it more or less captures many of the details that we want about the world. And on the basis of what we learn, we can then downstream perform planning and reasoning in order to accomplish any task of interest. Uh, so in my mind, to go back to your question, what is a model? I, I believe it is uh, what, how would the world respond to any changes that we make potentially make in the form of actions? Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, models in the way that you've defined them here are kind of a, a necessary prerequisite for us to achieve any any uh analogy to to transfer learning as we see it in vision and nlp in the rl setting it's actually a very interesting question this is like the long standing debate between model based and model free approaches in reinforcement learning and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's actually a very interesting and open question like my view on it is it ties back to the original point that i made which is like maybe the kinds of questions that we're asking in reinforcement learning are perhaps not the correct questions. Like maybe we should not be looking at solving a particular task because if the goal is to like make a robot pick up a particular object, do we necessarily need a very complicated model of the world? Perhaps not. Like maybe there are other perhaps more efficient ways uh, to solve that particular task. But if we now start changing our perspective and thinking about the set of all possible tasks that the robot can do in a scene, then the set of information that we may want to capture with any learning algorithm is much more richer than what we can uh, get simply on the basis of like model-free interactions. Maybe maybe the description of the task itself happens like much more downstream rather than in the early courses of learning. And in order for any model-free algorithm to work, it does require a description of the task in the form of a of a reward function to start performing any meaningful learning. Whereas with a model-based approach you can really just like let a robot wander freely and it can try to collect and assimilate as much information about the world as possible. And then a human can downstream come and say, okay, here is a particular task I want you to accomplish. And the robot can quickly figure that out. Maybe you can then say, here's a completely different task. And then the amount of time needed to get good on the second task might actually be like almost zero or very minimal, depending on what are the capabilities of the robot? Whereas in a model-free approach, it has to like relearn for every new description, that uh, or every new task description that the human may want. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I, I guess in summary, uh, as the set of possible things that we want the robot to do expands, then I guess models become more and more relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, tell us about morale. Yes, so morale is uh, uh, leveraging some of our recent advances in model-based reinforcement learning to make progress on this uh, topic of offline reinforcement learning. So offline reinforcement learning is uh, the setting where 
uh, an agent is given like a pre-collected data set of interactions with the environment. And on the basis of only these interactions, the agent has to learn a successful policy. And this has like uh, applications in many, many domains. Like, so for example, think about autonomous driving, where we may have like lots of uh, data of driving on the road, like either by autonomous vehicles or uh, by humans. And uh, we could leverage these offline uh, data sets to perform uh, efficient downstream uh, policy learning. Uh, another popular application uh, is uh, recommendation systems, where suppose we have uh, logs of user data of watching different videos, for example. Then on the basis of these logs, we can try to recommend new content that the user might like. Uh, so, so Moral tries to take like a model-based reinforcement learning approach to offline reinforcement learning, which for some reason has been like missing in literature for the while. Like there's been like an explosion of interest in offline learning, although much of it uh, is confined to model-free approaches. Uh, in this paper, we take a model-based approach where uh, essentially we learn a model of the world using the offline interaction data set. And using this learned model, we then uh, perform downstream policy optimization to accomplish the task. And the main contribution of Moral is that instead of just training a, a normal model from uh, the offline data set, we need to train a particular kind of a model that would allow this downstream reasoning to be uh, to be effective. Nice. And so, what are the what are the specific constraints that you um, kind of start off with in in defining the the problem as you attack it in the paper? Ah, uh, yes. So that's an interesting question. So. Uh, what we study primarily in that paper are what I would call like stateful uh, MDPs or compact state MDPs, where uh, for the purposes, it's not necessarily a strict requirement, but uh, for simplicity, we kind of assume access to a compact state representation of the world, meaning like the locations of different objects, uh, their 3D models, and maybe also uh, the location of the joints of the diff uh, different joints of the robot. Uh, so that gives us a more compact state representations to work with where learning the models typically tend to be easier. And uh, so that's sort of the, the primary uh, uh, like assumption that we make uh, in that particular work. And the specific models that we learn, uh, as I mentioned, tend to be error aware in the sense that it not only knows to predict what is going to be the next state in response to a particular action in a state, but we can also predict some notion of confidence about this particular prediction. Like either we are very confident in this particular prediction or maybe we are not that confident. And on the basis of this confidence, we partition the state space into what we call known and unknown regions. So known regions are those regions of the state space where we are fairly certain that the learned model is accurate. And the unknown regions are those where we are not certain whether the learned model could be accurate. Like it could still very well be accurate, but because we cannot be sure that it is going to be accurate, we're going to be conservative or pessimistic and assume that our predictions are not accurate and call them unknown. And after we make this particular partitioning of known and unknown regions, what Moral does is anytime the agent might go into these unknown regions in, in the sort of the learned MDP, which lives sort of internally in the head of the agent, uh, if it wanders into the unknown region, then we heavily penalize the agent for going into the unknown regions. What this effectively does is it constrains uh, the agent to only live within the known regions and optimize a policy within the set of known states where we know the model is going to be accurate. As a result, we can be pretty sure that the policy that we learn will transfer pretty well to that environment. And in particular, what we show is that the value of the policy in the pessimistic model that we construct is going to be a lower bound on the true performance of the policy. So we can be sure that if my policy, let's say, gets like thousand points in my like learned pessimistic MDP, then the policy will get at least thousand points in the real environment as well. And by constructing this lower bound and optimizing this lower bound, it allows us to have pretty stable algorithms to make progress on offline reinforcement learning. So in the traditional RL setup, uh, you've got this kind of explore exploit trade-off, um, and it sounds like 
here, at least in, in the context of the, you know, developing this model, you are heavily penalizing explore. Um, traditionally that results in, um, you know, suboptimal, uh, outcomes for your agent. Why is it different here? Uh, that's an excellent question. So in traditional RL, there is this like classic, uh, explore exploit tension where, uh, the goal is to try to learn the best policy possible for that particular MDP. And you cannot actually learn that without exploring different potential actions because like you can never be sure about what are the consequences of actions that you did not take. Maybe there is a magic pot of gold if you happen to take a particular action, but uh, you would never know it unless you actually tried that. Uh, in offline RL, uh, there is, we're going to sever the relationship between data collection and policy optimization. So the data is already collected and given to you, and you do not have the option of going and collecting new data. And this is very relevant for a number of applications, primarily for two reasons. One is safety, and the other is like related, but let's say for uh, ethical considerations. For example, in robotics, maybe if you want to explore too much, uh, let's say in autonomous driving, then it might lead to a lot of crashes. And that's we, we clearly want to avoid uh, that as possible, even if it means uh, losing out a little bit in terms of performance, safety matters much more rather than uh, squeezing out the final bit of performance. Similarly, in like medical trials, for example, suppose we want to discover new treatments, uh, we cannot just go and give people like you know, random drugs. Like that's just not ethical. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, the cost of exploration is like tremendously high, potentially even human lives in the case of uh, certain medical applications. So. Uh, there are a set of problems where we are willing to sacrifice on performance uh, for the sake of uh, safety or ethical concerns. And in those cases, offline order is particularly relevant because you can use all historical data sets that we may have. Let's say all the historical data sets in, uh, in medical trials or in, in autonomous driving. And purely on the basis of these data, these historical data sets, we can ask the question, what is the best policy that I can uh, hope to learn? And model kind of tries to attack that question of, maybe I cannot actually get the optimal policy, but can I at least get the best possible policy that I can get from this particular data set? And once we have that particular policy, maybe it's better than already existing policies. Let's say in autonomous driving or some industrial automation where there are like already existing warehouse robots or like uh, assembly line robots. Maybe perhaps we get a policy that like allows it to assemble faster or allows it to stack boxes faster. And after let's say another year of deployment of this particular policy, we'll now have a larger data set to work with and maybe we can extract an even better policy at that time and keep progressing that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in in the way you've set up the problem, it sounds like you're able to um, able to derive some specific guarantees around the performance or optimality of the result. Can you talk a little bit about about that? Certainly. So there are two main uh, theoretical insights, and we also validate some of them through empirical experiments uh, to see if our assumptions actually translate well to practice. And the two main theoretical results are number one, the policy that we learn or the value of the policy that we learn in the pessimistic MDP will be an approximate lower bound for the true value of the policy in the unknown environment. And this is valid for like any policy and that's the beauty because the way we construct the pessimistic MDP allows like a uniform lower bound for all possible policies. And as a result, we can now start to optimize on this particular lower bound and try to get the best policy. And the second uh, theoretical insight, and this is primarily valid, valid in what's called like the tabular reinforcement learning setting, which essentially assumes uh, like a, an infinitely powerful function approximator, like a table where every entry has like independent uh, parameters for you to capture all the details. Those are in, easy to come by. Sorry? Those are easy to come by. Uh, yeah, uh, well, easy to combine in theory. I think the that's the, <laughs> uh, it's the theoretician's uh, like ideal case. Uh, so uh, in, in that particular uh, setting, what we can show is model is minimax optimal. What that means is that uh, no reinforcement, no offline reinforcement learning algorithm, like even a yet-to-be-discovered one, 
can perform better than model for all problem instances. So in some sense, this is one of the strongest uh, guarantees that we can hope to get for hard instances like reinforcement learning. Of course, certainly it's valid only in, or we have been able to prove it only in the tabular setting. Uh, but that, that's at least a very promising first step where at least in this simplified uh, problem domain or problem description, uh, we can know for sure that our algorithm is uh, pretty much as good as any algorithm can get. Mm. Uh, so in the formulation of this kind of pessimistic MDPs, the the pessimism, it's offlineness and the the fact that you've that's the data that you have, or is there an additional kind of pessimistic constraint in the formulation? Ah, uh, yes. So it's a bit of both. So the pessimism comes from the fact that. Uh, so a, a naive algorithm would be just like learn a, a model from the data set and pretend as if the learned model is like the true model and just optimize the policy. The problem there is that you can go and exploit any inaccuracies in your model in order to just like get more rewards. So there's like the standard bias or model exploitation problem uh, in model-based reinforcement learning. What we can do is add this additional step where after we learn the dynamics model, uh, we're going to modify the reward function. And that's where the pessimism comes from. And the modification to the reward function is in the known regions, which is basically where we're confident that the predictions of the model are going to be accurate. We're not going to modify the rewards. Like there, the agent is free to try to optimize for the rewards. But any place where we're not confident about the predictions, we're going to penalize the reward function by actually making it extremely pessimistic. What this would mean is that if the agent Ha happens to go into the unknown regions, then it would receive a huge penalty. And because policy optimization tries to optimize the rewards and minimize penalties, it would avoid going into the un unknown regions and stay only within the known regions where we know that the performance will be good. And this is what allows us to make this like lower bound guarantee and also ensure that the learned policy actually transfers pretty well to the unknown MDP. Hmm. You mentioned that in addition to the theoretical results, you did some experimentation as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So, uh, so there is uh, so offline RL is kind of a very young field, which is like rapidly growing, and there are like a few very excellent benchmarks that have been set up. Like one of them uh, that we followed is from this paper called like Behavior Regularized Actor Critic, where they set up. Uh, four different standard Mujoko environments that most people in reinforcement learning would be familiar with. So this was, in some sense, inspired by uh, applications in robotics and character animation, where we want to uh, uh, make certain simulated characters walk or run forward as fast as possible. And the faster that the agent runs, the more reward that the agent would get. And uh, so if we take four such characters uh, from this behavior regularized actor critic paper and five different data sets per character. So each data set uh, would come from policies of different quality. One policy could, for example, be uh, with a completely random action where the agent isn't really making any meaningful forward progress. But nevertheless, just by thrashing the motors, you can kind of understand how the limbs would react to different motor actuations, for example. And, and another policy could be, uh, sorry. And by characters here, we're talking about kind of humanoid versus non-humanoid uh, configurations of the, the the agent in the Majoko environment? Yes, more or less. So this could be like a, a, a stick figure with just two legs. It could be like a half cheetah, which is like a quadruped, but sliced lengthwise. Yeah. Uh, there is like also a quadruped involved and there's like a hopping agent. So these are fairly simple and well-known simulated characters in mm -hmm. the reinforcement learning community. Uh, that has been like the subject of many, many papers, I would say. And uh, what, what uh, we consider, like, uh, as, as I said, different uh, data sets that come by collecting data using different policies. So some policies could be have like policies of very poor quality, essentially very close to random. Other policies could be very high quality, closer to almost like expert demonstration. So that would be almost pushing at the boundaries of like imitation learning or learning from demonstrations. And there could be also policies in the intermediate regime where the hopping agent, for example, still hops forward like a little bit, 
but not using a very efficient gate. Maybe it can perform like a three or four hops and then it would fall down as opposed to completing like an entire sequence of hopping. And similarly, a walking agent could be limping instead of like walking properly. So these are actually perhaps the most interesting ones because they are representative of also real world applications where we would typically typically have some sort of a hand designed policy uh, that is already functioning reasonably well. Think of like recommendation systems or uh, warehouse robots where we already have like Netflix recommendations, for example, but we can certainly try to improve on these recommendations by using historical log data. Uh, so overall we have four uh, simulated characters and five data sets per character. So that's overall 20 domains in the benchmark. And what we found was that in 14 out of the 20 domains, uh, Mara was able to get the best results. And the next best algorithm, I believe, got uh, the best results in five out of the 20 domains. And what is what was also particularly interesting is that whenever Morel got the best results, it was better than the second best algorithm by like a significant amount. Whereas mm -hmm. whenever some of the other algorithms got the best results and Morel was like the second best algorithm, the gap in performance was actually pretty small. Mm -hmm. Did you have any particular intuition about why it didn't outperform uh, in certain environments? You know, why the performance gains weren't more uniform across these different characters and policies? That's actually an excellent question. And I, I believe it also ties to like, uh, it, it's both a strength and weakness of model-based reinforcement learning. So in model-based reinforcement learning, once you learn a model, let's say in offline reinforcement learning where we, we learn the pessimistic model. You have a variety of choices in terms of reinforcement learning algorithms to get a policy out of the learned model. You could use like model predictive control style uh, algorithms. You could use like PPO style uh, policy learning algorithms, or you could use like other algorithms similar to like soft actor predict, for example. Uh, by making different choices of these algorithms, uh, in conjunction with the model, you can expect different quality of results. Like for certain domains, certain downstream policy learning algorithms may be better suited than others. So in in the in particular, the domain where we did not get the best results, where in, the, in this half cheetah environment, where soft actor critic or largely actor critic based reinforcement learning algorithms are known to get much better results than PPO. And we use PPO to learn uh, the policy from the model. And as a result, like wherever PPO tends to work pretty well, we also got pretty good results. And where PPO does not work as well, uh, we, we, we were not able to get good results. But, but the advantage with model-based RR is that you could easily swap out PPO with soft actor critic in the exact same framework. Like you make like no change, you just learn the model, you add the same pessimism, and you just use a different uh, policy learning algorithm to get your policy. And by swapping out one for the other, you might get better results. So if we were to smartly pick different choices for different environments or different tasks, then overall we can expect better results. For example, there are also domains uh, like dexterous hand manipulation, for example, where model predictive control is known to work like really well compared to policy learning algorithms. So in, in those cases, we could easily use model predictive control instead of PPO or soft actor critic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in your last comment, you mentioned smartly pick the policy and I'm, I took that as kind of a, you know, offline design time picking. I don't recall, uh, talking much or hearing much about like ensembling of RL models. Is, is that a big thing in, in research? Uh, has there been a lot of work in that area? I guess so. That's a, uh, that's an interesting question. So that ties back into this notion of uh, how do we partition uh, the state space into known and unknown regions? And what I said was, if we are, if we are confident about the quality of predictions, uh, then we will call that known. And if you're not so confident, then we'll call it unknown. How mm -hmm. do we get these confidence intervals? Well, there are like a slew of different techniques to get that. One of the, the easiest and most commonly used are these like bootstrap or ensemble based approaches where instead of training uh, just a single model, we train ensembles of different models and look at the disagreement between predictions of the different ensembles to inform our confidences. For example, like uh, just to give like an intuitive explanation, 
suppose we consider like 10 different models all initialized differently and then we're going to train all of the, these different models using the same data set well all the models will agree wherever we have we have the data because the learning algorithm and the data set will force the predictions of these models to agree wherever we have the data but wherever we don't have the data different models are likely to make different kinds of errors they will not they, they will make errors but they are unlikely to make the same errors they might make different errors uh, across the different uh, models in the ensemble and by looking at the disagreement between the predictions we can get a sense of uh, how confident we can be about our predictions uh, so that's kind of what we used in our empirical studies as well but i should also note that that's not the only approach there may be a variety of different approaches uh, for informing these confidences what i consider to be primarily important is looking at the confidence of the model to inform uh, to to inform this partitioning of known versus unknown how exactly we perform uh, 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 how exactly do we get a sense of the confidence intervals is uh, is is a very much an open question and there may be uh, a variety of different uh, uh, research ideas that we could do there so that's like a very exciting direction for future work and there yeah, are some thoughts uh, 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 that are hopefully going to be released soon on that as well mm -hmm. Uh, on that point, is it a does it limit application to to what degree does it limit application to have to have this very clear sense of confidence around uh, the the models predictions and performance? Yeah, so that's a great question, and that uh, is related to uh, what sort of problems that we work with. So. Uh, if you recall, like I made a comment earlier that one of the assumptions or simplifications that we made in this paper was that we assumed access to a compact state representation. What that allows us is the ability to use ensembles to form these confidence intervals. But suppose we were in the vision space, for example, then ensembles of models in vision spaces can be uh, either very difficult or may not form very good uh, confidence intervals because uh, since these models are going to be significantly more higher dimensional, maybe it's not sufficient to have just like five or ten models in the ensemble. Maybe we need we need hundreds of members in the ensemble. At which point, they're also each model is also significantly bigger because of the vision component, and it might essentially become intractable. So that's kind of why we may need alternate methods to form these confidence intervals uh, for like more richer uh, uh, and for scaling, uh, more richer domains and for scaling up. And that's uh, a topic of research that we've been uh, focusing on recently as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so experimentally, you use the um, Majoku simulations to validate some of your results. Uh, you've also talked about kind of the... Um, you know, the, the typical traditional offline examples like healthcare um, are, you know, how close are you to trying to apply it in those more practical uh, examples? Do we even have standard data sets uh, in those uh, that, you know, that are more closely mapped to those types of examples? Uh, yes. So this is sort of uh where we hope to be in in a couple of years so cl clearly the the real applications are not quite uh in grasp yet but uh that's also partly because like offline oral is, is a very young field like yeah. uh, much of the work has happened largely in the last couple of years and now i guess the the primary goal for most researchers is just to develop a good toolkit of algorithms uh so that we can use the better algorithms to deploy them downstream for real applications. So suppose there are like, you know, 500 contender algorithms, it might be very hard to like deploy each of them for practical applications and like test their efficacy. For example, like, like thinking about like Google, for example, maybe they want to actually deploy offline reinforcement learning to improve their YouTube service. Uh, it might actually be pretty difficult for them to, they try out 500 different algorithms at which point they might lose their entire customer base. So maybe they may want to uh, limit the scope to like the five best algorithms out of the 500 algorithms and only try those five best algorithms for real applications. And the same goes for like uh, clinical trials or uh, 
the autonomous driving and so on. So I think right now where we are at is the stage where we're trying to develop new algorithms and narrow down the set of ideas and try to identify the best algorithms. And some of the recent research work on setting up better benchmarks, for example, is like very helpful in this endeavor. We can use those to try to uh, prune out the search space of algorithms and then uh, try the better algorithms on real applications. Mm. Uh, in your abstract, you mentioned that you see one of the applications uh, of this approach as being in generative modeling. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. So uh, more so, I, I view it uh, the other way around in the sense that any advances in generative modeling could be directly useful in offline reinforcement learning. Uh, so for, for example, in the image space example that uh, we just talked about, like uh, uh, right now our vision models are like still pretty primitive in our video prediction models. They can hardly predict like you know, five seconds into the future. And maybe the five seconds into the future is really not much if you want to solve like realistic robot problems. So perhaps what we need are uh, more advances on the generative modeling side and coupling them very closely to model learning so that we can learn uh, models that can predict better and also predict longer into the future so that we can use them for offline reinforcement learning. Got it, got it. Like, likewise, as we get better at uncertainty estimation, we've talked a little bit about exactly. that. That's only going to improve what you're doing. Advances in planning are only going to improve what you're doing. Exactly. And uh, that's the actually, that's the strength of model-based methods that makes me very excited. It's very modular that there is like a model learning component, there is a policy learning component, there is an uncertainty estimation component. And any advances in any of these fields, we can directly port them over and see immediate results in offline reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning in general. And this modular structure, at least to me, uh, is a lot, is very encouraging that uh, we can make more rapid advances. Got it, got it. Uh, I think you said your other research interest is on the meta-learning side. Uh, yeah, what are you up to there? Uh, yes, so that's actually, well, it's a very fun collaboration. And I should also, like, at this stage, acknowledge all my collaborators. Uh, on the meta learning front, it's like joint work with Chelsea Finn, Sergey Levin, and Sham Kakade. And on, on the moral side, it's like with Rahul Kidambi, Pranit Netropali, and uh, Thorsten Joachims. And Rahul, in particular, is like a joint co author, a joint first author on the moral paper. So uh, uh, going back to the to, to sort of my research vision, which is uh, how can we make uh, agents solve a variety of tasks with modest amount of experience? That ties in very nicely with this question of meta-learning. And that prompted me to start looking at meta-learning, where the goal is essentially uh, using historical experiences, can we adapt our learning algorithms itself in order to solve uh, the particular task like, much more efficiently? And what, what I felt when I started looking at uh, meta learning was that it's also very much in, in the in a stage of infancy where it's just like starting to pick up. And uh, it wasn't quite ready for direct porting or direct applications into reinforcement learning uh, just yet. And this was, we did this project like about uh, a year or so ago. So what we ended up doing was shifting focus a little bit and trying to lay down better mathematical and theoretical foundations for uh, meta-learning. So some of the open questions, uh, there, there were a number of open questions in meta-learning at that time, like uh, do our meta-learning algorithms actually converge? If so, what do they converge to? What is the rate at which they converge? What sort of uh, results can we expect uh, at the end uh, in meta-learning? Like, can we actually enable few short learning? So like many fundamental questions remained open at that time. And we started looking at some of those aspects. So what we were able to show uh, using certain uh, modifications to standard meta-learning algorithms is that we can actually show proof of convergence. We can show proof of convergence at a pretty efficient rate. And we can also show that a pretty good characterization of where they converge to. And all of this is like still in the non-convex uh, setting where uh, like in our initial paper, we made some of these uh, ideas clear in the convex setting, which is like clearly a restrictive assumption similar to like tabular reinforcement learning. Uh, but nevertheless, in our follow-up paper, we were able to uh, expand it and uh, make connections to more meaningful non-convex setting and also show empirical results. All right, All right. 
Well, Arvin, it was great to have an opportunity to learn a bit about your research. Thanks so much. Awesome. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you.